Well, we're going to resume our study of the fruit of the Spirit, and today is goodness. And as we begin, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what is goodness? That seems like such a simple thing. I mean, since you were a child, your parent has been telling you, be good. Do you notice your parents never told you, be bad? <clears throat> never. Be good. <clears throat> so we've had this, this word pounded into our brain, but the real question is, what is goodness? So we first have to ask ourselves what it is to be good. What, what is good? <clears throat> what is good? And I have the answer. It's found in the Bible. God is good. Now I want you to say that with me, okay? God is good. That's so important. All right? God is good. Here's how I know. The Bible tells me so. All right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Or, though, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. Or another place. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Still another place. Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. Still another place. The Lord is good to those who hope in him, the ones who seek him. And if you haven't gathered anything yet, it is this idea that the Lord is good. What the Bible is saying is that God is intrinsically good. He is the good. He is the standard. You can use the, an equal sign for the word is. God equals good. That's a fact. God is good. If something is good, it is only good by measuring up to God. Let that sink in for a moment. Something is only good when it measures up to God. When it falls short of measuring up to God, it is not good. You know what there's a word for that in the Bible? It's called sin. Is to fall short of the God who is good. God is intrinsically good. Not only is he good, but God only does good. Do you realize that? God can't do bad. God can't do evil. God can only do good. We studied this psalm uh, earlier this year, Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel. Israel was his people. And this is the way we framed that whole message was, God is only good to his people. God is only good. Now, now watch with the rest of us. To those who are, are, are pure in heart, God is only good. The Lord is good to all. Not just his people, he's good to everyone. You know, you get up on a nice day and the sun is out shining and you step outside and there's a little briskness in the air and you say, what a great, beautiful, good day. You know what? It's not just good for you. It's good for the guy that is an evil, terrible horrendous person. It's a good day to him too. You see, God is good. He's good to all and he has compassion on all he has made. We're not always so compassionate to people. God is always compassionate. Always compassionate. He is good. God is always good. Listen to this verse. And we know that in all things, God works for the good. God is doing good. He works good to those who are called according to his purpose. Those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God does good. That's all he does. Joseph, saying to his brothers who had treated him very poorly, all right, sold him into slavery, he says, you meant evil against me when you did all those bad, horrendous things, but God meant it for good. You see, God is so good, he even works the evil things that are happening in your life for good. God is only good to his people. So then, question is, what is goodness? We now know what good is. God is good. Intrinsically, that's who he is. He is good. So that everything he does is good. So then, what is goodness? Well, the answer is, goodness is the state or quality of being like God. When I... Remember the, exp the expression, what would Jesus do? <laughs> okay. Do what Jesus would do. When, when I do what Jesus would do, because Jesus is God come in the flesh, 
When I do that, I, I'm doing as God would do. I, I am doing goodness. That what I'm doing is goodness. Goodness is the state or quality of being like God. You see, things or creatures are good when they conform to God and His intended purpose. Wow. It's good when it conforms to God. Do you remember the verse uh, in Leviticus? It's also in 1 Peter. Be holy, for I am holy. Absolutely set apart from wrong, evil, sin. Be holy, for I am holy. When I am holy, set apart from all that is contrary to God, I'm good. That's goodness. That's goodness. Goodness is not, here's what it is not, some external standard that we set up to which God has to achieve. He is the standard. God is the good. God is the good. If something is good, it is only good by measuring up to Him, His purpose for which He created it. God is good. Now, I get this from time to time. Somebody says to me, a good God would not send anyone to hell. You know, there's only a, a little problem here. What they're actually saying is, I am setting up the standard for goodness. My standard is much higher than the Bible's because uh, I set the standard for goodness to which any concept of a God must conform or that God is not God. And so if this person is saying, I'm God, I set what is good, you're God, better measure up to me because I am God over God. You see what I'm saying? Rather than what the Bible says, God is good. And we must conform to his standard. I cannot set a standard over God that's mine to which he must conform. I got it all backwards. Got it all backwards. In fact, Jesus said, when you set up that standard, it's wrong. No one is good except God alone. Would you repeat Jesus' words with me? No one is good except God alone. God is good. Man, sometimes we question it, don't we? We question it. When something like what took place in Virginia happens, we question it. We question it. But God did not do that. Evil people did that. You know, the truth is, the God of the Bible is good. He sends people to hell because he is good. And they are evil. It's just that simple. A good judge renders sentences. God is a good judge. He is good. All his judgments are good. It is because he is good and that they are evil that they wind up in the place prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, the important, most important point I want to get across today is just simply this right here. If you can get this and take this home with you, you, you got the thrust of the whole message. So say it with me again. God is good. God is good. God is good. Now, all goodness must conform to who he is, what he does, and what he says. That's all my long introduction, so you get to now start filling in some of the blanks, okay? Then the bulleted there as you're going through it, because I'm finally getting to the message, long introduction, that God is good, okay? And I don't want you to forget that. The story is illustrated by the rich young ruler, okay? And the rich young ruler had a dishonest inquiry. He's really not wanting the answers to the question that he has. He's wanting to justify himself that he is a good person worthy of eternal life. That's what's going on. So he's got a dishonest inquiry as he comes to Jesus. Well, he went to the right person to get an answer, okay? A certain ruler asked him, that is Jesus, he went to the right person, and the fact that you're here today and you're at church, you've come to the right place when you come to the Bible to get the right answers to the questions of life. He went to the right source. He went to the right person. And he asked an important question. It's a really important question. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
I think that's like probably uh, the top of all the really important questions in life. Uh, I would like to have eternal life, live forever, to be with God forever. Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I think the emphasis here is what must I do to inherit eternal life? What, what work can I do? How, what can I perform? How, what can I do to get eternal life? And so Jesus gives them a corrective response. It's kind of like, whoa, I didn't quite catch this. He's focused on getting eternal life. And Jesus said, whoa, I, you stopped me when you said, good master. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. Here's our expression. Say it with me. No one is good except God alone. What he's saying to him is, do you really mean what you say? If only God is good, you're calling me good master. Do you really believe that I am God? You see what's going on here? Do you really believe that I am the Son of God? You see, Peter confessed that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So if you're the Son of the living God, then you are God. He's saying here, do you really mean what you say? that I'm God, come in the flesh? No one's good except God alone. Then Jesus offers a really intriguing quotation. He goes to the Ten Commandments. He said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. He is quoting from the second tablet. There were two tablets. The first tablet had four commands on it, all God word. The second tablet had six commandments on it, and they're all horizontal, how we treat our fellow man. And that's what he's quoting here. But what Jesus has done is he shuffled the deck. He didn't put the, the commandments in order. It's pretty interesting. He says, do not commit adultery. That's the seventh commandment. He says then, do not murder. That's the sixth commandment. Oh, they're going backwards. And then Jesus says, do not steal. That's the eighth commandment. So he's going back. And then he says, do not give false testimony. Don't lie. That's the ninth commandment. And then he says, honor your father and mother, which is the fifth commandment. So he's kind of shuffled the deck. The question is, where is the tenth commandment? I think Jesus shuffled the deck and left it out so that the young man would realize something's missing here, okay? He's got to think these through. I mean, there's a reason why he shuffles the deck here. Hey, something's missing here, the 10th commandment. Do you know what the 10th commandment is? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, his possessions, his donkey, and all that. You shall not covet. Don't covet. And he, I think, deliberately leaves that out because the the rich young ruler, thinking of all the things that he could do to inherit eternal life, he says, oh, these I have kept since I was a boy. I'm a pretty good person. Hey, do I get eternal life? Look at all the good things I've done. He said, I've done all these since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, hmm, you still lack one thing. Which one? The Tenth Commandment. There's the Tenth Commandment. And what is that? He says, this is what you do. Go sell everything you have. Whoa. That's a little close to home. He said, then when you sell it, give that money to the poor. Whoa, man, you know, he's really sweating now. And he said, then, then you will have great treasure in heaven. He said, do that. And then come follow me. Become a follower of me. Jesus did not condemn him. He didn't say, aha, you guilty sinner, you didn't keep the 10th commandment. You're coveting all your possessions. He didn't stick it in his face. No, what Jesus was doing was exposing. He was facilitating the discussion to bring him to the point of realization, I really like my stuff more than I like following you. I've called you God. I like my stuff better than following God. He's breaking the 
Tenth Commandment of coveting. When he heard this, he became very sad, very sad, because he was a man of great wealth. You know, sometimes I think it's easier for poor people to tithe than rich people. I don't know why that is. Uh, you'd think the rich people have a lot, so they can give a lot. Uh, but I can remember at my church in Philadelphia, there was a gal who was on welfare, and she was tithing her welfare check. And there were people in our church who had great jobs and didn't tithe. I, I just, I, I didn't get it. But God lifted her out of her poverty and, and got her a career, and, and, and she realized, she learned from when she had a little that, that she, she tied that to God, that God would bless if she tied the lot. All right? He was of great wealth, and, and the commandment here, uh, when, when the instruction of Jesus was, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and then follow me. Following me is crucial. He said, but I've got to see, are you really in this? Are you in this for me? Or is it because you like all the things you got in life? What's it about for you? What's it about? He gave a uh, pretty clear instruction. And then we get this final conclusion. I call it a hyper... Uh, hyperbole. It's, it's a, an extended, uh, it, it's an over-exaggerated point that he's making. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You say, well, that's impossible. To get a big camel through the eye of a needle, that is impossible. That's exactly the point he's wanting to make. When it comes to what you can do to e inherit eternal life, you can't do anything. It's impossible. You can keep all the commandments, but you won't. You won't. We've all offended. And, and James says, if you offend in one point, just coveting, one time, you're guilty of breaking all the law of God because that constitutes you a lawbreaker. The standard is this. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Anybody here perfect, raise your hand. My wife is over there. Take your hand out. <laughs> yeah. You know you're not perfect. I cannot do anything to inherit eternal life. It would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And you say, that's impossible. It's impossible for you to earn the gift of eternal life. You can't earn it. It's of the grace of God. It's a gift. You can only receive it. You can't earn it. You can't do anything for it. The man made a very poor decision. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. You see, it came down to a choice. Do I become a follower of Jesus or do I worship my stuff? That's what it was. Which commandment had he broken? Probably all of them, but uh, this one in particular, that he coveted his stuff more than he did the Lord God. He coveted it. He went away very sad. The second part of the, the passage that we're, we're, we're exploring here, the disciples of Jesus, they come to him with a real honest inquiry that led to the right person. They went to Jesus. They said, it says, those who heard them, heard him, ask Jesus. This is what they asked. They just heard what Jesus did with this ruler. And, and he said, who then can be saved? Oh, my goodness. If... if it's a camel going through the eye of the needle. It's, it's that impossible. Who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. This is a really powerful answer. There's not one of us here who can save ourselves by keeping the Ten Commandments or by doing good because none of us have done good perfectly. We all fall short we all fall short. But what is impossible with man is possible with God that God became man and God, okay, became man. He lived the perfect life in a human body 
And God shed his blood on the cross. He did the impossible. You say, how did God shed his blood? That's what it says in Acts chapter 20. God shed his blood on the cross. In the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, God became man and united the divine nature and the human nature into one. So everything that can be said of Jesus as a man is true. Everything that can be said of any man of Jesus is true except for sin. And everything that can be said of God can be said of Jesus. Everything. So he is the God-man. He did what we could never do, go to the cross and die for someone else's sin. We all have to die for our own. You see, what was impossible for man to do, inherit eternal life, get the gift of God eternal life, it took God to do. So with man, it's impossible, but all things are possible with God. God does it. Peter said to him, well, we have left all that we had. What? To follow you. This is genuine faith commitment. When you give it all to the Lord, you say, I'm all in, I'm all with you, I'm trusting in you and you alone, nothing that I'm doing, not my stuff, not not what I have, I forsake it all, all for you, I'm all in Jesus. The disciples said, we've given it all up to follow you, we left it all. You know, that's what a genuine Christian does. They leave it all behind. Now, do we have to have stuff? Of course we have to have stuff. I have to have a meal like three times a day. <laughs> all right? I have to have clothing. I have to have, do I have to have stuff? Yes. But when I covet that stuff more than the Lord, I'm not following him. I'm not following him. Jesus was exposing that he was coveting the stuff more than he was a relationship with God. He said, we've left all. We, we, we left our nets. We left our fishing. We left our families. We left our wives. Peter did. He left his wife behind. He wasn't following Jesus. I tell you the truth, Jesus answers. Here's a great promise. No one who has left home or wife or brother or parents or children. Do you realize This is a pretty powerful call. It may necessitate leaving everyone you know and being the only Christian in your family. Being persecuted and isolated all alone. So no one who has left all of that for the sake of the kingdom of God to become a Christian, to follow of Jesus Christ, he says, well, uh, well, fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. I love this verse. Because it tells me eternal life doesn't just begin when I die. It's in this life, God is going to bless me with the quality of an eternal life that when I die in my body, I'm going to go and experience to the ultimate and the max eternal life forever and ever and ever. In this age and that to come, eternal life. I already have eternal life, the gift of God in Jesus Christ my Lord. I I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I got it now. I'm going to have it forever. He's given a great promise. So how do you do goodness? How do you do goodness? You can't. You can't do it. You have got to accept Jesus Christ who did goodness. He imputes, he charges that goodness to your account and what he has done is credited to you and it's put into your account so the only goodness you have is what Jesus has given you. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have goodness. If you have Jesus, you've got goodness. In fact, the text says, we don't really do it. God the Holy Spirit does goodness in us because we've received Jesus and he lives in our hearts by faith and he produces the goodness in us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I accepted Jesus as an eight-year-old boy. I got a down payment of the goodness then, the Holy Spirit. As I walk in the Spirit, I achieve that goodness that God calls good. Not what other people call good. God calls good.
The Holy Spirit produces goodness when you walk in the Spirit and you conform to the good. You conform to what God is. That's how it works. Let's pray. As we bow our heads for prayer, I just want to ask you a question. Um, maybe you, you, you feel like the rich young ruler. Um, you're so occupied with the stuff, preoccupied with the stuff of life. You've never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, to be the one who gives you the goodness you need. And you realize that, and you say, you know what, I, I need his goodness because I'm bankrupt. If that's so, I want you to pray right now like this. Father in heaven, you pray it. Father in heaven, I'm bankrupt of goodness. But Jesus is the good one. I want to receive him in all his goodness. I want him to be my God. I want him to be my Savior. I surrender all to him. I am going to be a follower of Jesus. Save me, Lord, I pray. Father, we know if anyone just makes a heart commitment of faith and trust, forsaking themselves and depending solely upon Jesus as Lord and Savior. It says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Surely goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of their life. And then they will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Visit us now, Lord, with the assurance that we have the Spirit of Christ and the goodness of God within us. And then, Lord, help us to work out the salvation you worked in, to be kind and tender-hearted, to be good, to have goodness. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
God is good. One final time, say it with me. God is good. Here we go. God is good all the time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, bless us as we leave this place. May we go forth realizing how good you are, how great you are, how marvelous our salvation is because we couldn't do it. It would be easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for us to save ourselves. Impossible. But you did the impossible in sending your son. You are a good God. It is your goodness, your kindness that leads us to repentance. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, that you changed our hearts to believe in him. Bless us, O Lord, this Lord's day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.